As crabbing season kicks off, the Coast Guard launches by air, land, and sea when a fishing vessel slams into a massive jetty. This is a fishing vessel eclipse. I am on the rock. It's a real dangerous situation for us and the person on board. Everybody eyes on that boat. On the Pacific coast, a surfer hits rough water and wipes out on the rocks. They're just big, jagged rocks that are slippery, that are difficult to move around on. And we're getting ready to bring a hurricane force wind on top of them to do this hoist. This is uh, surfboard all fast up in the rocks. And local police call the Coast Guard to team up on a manhunt that sends searchers deep into the Oregon woods. The troopers are pretty certain that the guy is armed. And I see something moving at 3 o'clock low, and it looks like a guy sitting down. High peaks and tumultuous waters make Cape Disappointment and the Pacific Northwest one of the most hazardous environments in North America. At the heart of it all is the Columbia River Bar. This deadly area has taken countless vessels and claimed hundreds of lives. In the air and on the sea, brave men and women of the U.S. Coast Guard risk their own safety so that others may live in a place known as the Graveyard of the Pacific. Lieutenant Scott McGrew, Coast Guard Station, Cape Disappointment. The uh, Washington and Oregon uh, Dungeness crab season kicks off between the 1st of December and the 15th of December. And leading up to the opening, you see uh, tons of pot work being done in the parking lots and boat yards all around town. I can fit more down here unless you want the middle three. Right. Crab season kicks off right as we get into our uh, strong winter storms. Big Pacific Northwest lows slide down from the Gulf of Alaska, and, and it's going to bring in weather that's, uh, that's going to challenge our crews and it's going to challenge those fishermen to go out there and uh, haul their pots back. You got your bait, right, boys? Right. Yeah, we're going to try to blow it up. We'll take These guys have been waiting for crab season to open. They want to get a paycheck. So these guys are going to go out there no matter what the weather's doing. They're going to push the limits to fish their gear. It actually becomes one of our busier times and one of the more risky times of the year to be operating here. Coast Guard, you're Bay. This is the fishing vessel Eclipse. I am adrift on the South Jetty. Fishing vessel Eclipse adrift heading towards South Jetty. I am on the rock. Stand by. I'm being 3 Travis Claycomb. Crab season is our biggest season as far as expecting SAR. There's a lot of boats out every day, all day. Fishing vessel Eclipse struck the south jetty wall, and we're taking on water. Now first boat, first boat lay. Komodo lifeboat 47268 for a vessel adrift and towards south jetty rocks. We have three assets on their way to the scene. A 47 motor lifeboat, a ground party that will head out to the jetty on foot, and a helo at a Newport Air Facility. Station 66, we're on our way. 66 station, they're on the south jetty. They're hard to ground. The boat is starting to possibly turn over. We have three people, one on the rock, one still on board and one in the water. Right orbit around the south setting. Okay, roger. Hey, Sean, you want to kick that uh, searchlight on? Roger, searchlight's coming off. I'm Lieutenant Patrick Wright, work here at Sector North Bend, Oregon. When we hear PIW, or person in the water, we ramp it up. We know that unless this person has specific immersion suits on or some sort of survival suit, they're not going to last long in the Pacific Northwest conditions. All right, Sean, do you see anything? All right, let's say we got a couple people on the rocks. One is out of the water, one is getting out of the water. I've got the jetty lit up. Looks like there's a couple people standing around. Looks like one guy is uh, laying down. I've got the uh, ground party on scene as well. Sean Spence, I'm stationed here at Air Station North Bend. When we got back on scene, I saw that one survivor laid out on the rocks. The other survivor was there. The commanding officer from the small boat station was actually out there communicating with us. City over, rescue 24. Request to know is anybody in immediate danger over. 
Rescue 24, CDO, Roger, both individuals. One individual is making it back to the weight EMS with a couple members of my beach party. I have uh, one individual showing signs of extreme hypothermia and confusion. Uh, request uh, medevac assistance, over. CDO from Rescue 24, Roger. All right, guys, looks like they want us to do a hoist. We lit up the area with the night sun so that everybody would be able to see and decided uh, as a crew that we were going to do a trail line delivery of the basket. We do have a boat on scene, so uh, if the survivor does go into the water, we'll be able to pick them up pretty quick. Station 6-6, six, six, you got visual on the boat. My name's Brian Ballinger, Petty Officer 2nd Class, Boats' Mate, the Coast Guard, Station Yukona Bay. The Eclipse was sitting bow to the rocks. One crew went on board. They had hit the rocks, and the vessel was listing to its starboard side. Do you know if you're taking all water yet? Taking all water in the engine room and the stern. I can get off the rocks, I can get stabilized and get my bottom going. You're listening pretty hard right now. Station 6-6, six, six, they got a hard list to uh, starboard. Best chances to maybe get a pump running and try to get it stable. Let's get the P-6 on that boat. We got to try to get water off the boat. We had to get a pump on that boat and, and out of the can and, and start it up. Hey, I'm just going to bump up right up to his side, all right? You're going to hand it right to him. The Eclipse is about 20 to 50 feet off the jetty and makes it difficult to approach. Waves are six to eight foot rolling swell, which close to the jetty, very likely possibility that they can hit the jetty again, start rocking up against the jetty. Get that pump over now. We passed over a P6 to watering pump. We passed over a radio because they had lost power. While we're doing this, circling the vessel, we're trying not to run over crab pots that have fallen off the eclipse, trying not to get tangled into those lines and then be on the jetties ourselves. Every time he rolls up on the swell, that free surface effect is causing uh, a lot of roll. So I don't know how long it's going to hold up. It might just end up going over in a matter of minutes. Good, I've got about two feet of water in there. So all we're worried about is the engine room right now. All right, I don't have another pump. Is that the, you, the rip cord pulled? Yeah. I can get you in tow real quick. So when the P6 pump can didn't work out, we had to get that tow set up as quickly as possible to get the boat away from those rocks. Station 6-6, six, six. I think we might get them put in tow real quick. If we can get somebody to meet us with another pump, that'd be good. My thinking process was we'd have enough time to get them into port, and, and it would be a, a safer move to start transiting into port. Go it! Hold up, just pull it in, keep pulling. Five out. Let's the right out. The bow would lean forward and it would look like it's about to just, just flip and roll over. Keep a good eye on that boat for me. Everybody eyes on that boat. Let me know if it does anything out of the ordinary. There's a lot of water on that starboard side. Let's go around. Fishing vessel Eclipse struck the south jetty wall and were taken on water. We had three assets on their way to the scene, a 47 motor lifeboat, a ground party that will head out to the jetty on foot, and a helo at a Newport Air Facility. All right, Sean, you say anything? Uh, looks like we got a couple people on the rocks. One is out of the water, one is getting out of the water. You're listening pretty hard right now. Life cutting out. Let's on the right out. Keep a good eye on that boat for me. Everybody eyes on that boat. Let me know if it does anything out of the ordinary. There's a lot of water on that starboard side. Hey, good job, guys. Keep a good eye on it, though. There's a ton of water on that starboard side. They're still taking on water. It's a real dangerous situation for us and the person on board. We're on the right wave, and they, they can just We're roll right down over. North. Just have one uh, survivor to pick up from the jetty. CDO, rescue 24, rescue 24 on 109. Over. Rescue 24, CDO, go ahead. Or we're uh, starting our approach now. Roger, also be advised, uh, he's in and out of consciousness still and uh, starting to vomit, see water out. I am Chief Warrant Officer Rob Ornelas. 
Commanding Officer, Coast Guard Station Yakuna Bay. As we were waiting uh, for the helo to get ready for the medevac and complete their checklist, the individual stopped shivering. We knew that his core temperature was definitely going down. Mike, with the uh, ground party down there, I don't think we really want to uh, actually put you down to the rocks for this one. We'll have you sit out. Yeah, that sounds good. Let's just uh, send some blankets down to them in the basket and make sure they get them on and keep them warm. All right, they're going to go ahead and start dropping down the line there. James, we're going to get you out of here as soon as we can. That's going up. We had some concerns about the hoist. For one, the rocks were very, very slippery. The footing was off. We were going to be overhead forcing winds down on the people, which was going to make it even harder for them to stand. Um, so we, we were very concerned with them handling the basket and the trail line down on the rocks. When I got the basket on deck, we backed off a little bit to lower the wind effect on the survivor. They were able to get him in. Very quickly, they, they bundled some blankets around him to help keep him warm because he's very hypothermic, and we were able to move back in for the pickup. Take a little back, clear deck, clear, move back left. Go back and left. As the basket's going up, the biggest thing is tending that line to make sure that the basket is steady. That's coming inside of Kevin. Studio from the 6524. We uh, got one survivor aboard. We're going to be uh, landing at the Newport Airport momentarily for uh, transfer to the ambulance. James Gillespie from Newport, Oregon. I was the block man on the fishing vessel Eclipse. My favorite constellation is Orion, and Orion was shining bright that night. And uh, I was just looking up at Orion to ask him to help me through this. You know, this is not my time to go. Yeah, I don't think this is my time to go. My body was shivering out of control. I was just so cold, I couldn't even talk. When the Coast Guard chopper came, I wanted to cry. <laughs> I had survived something that I thought I would never go through, you know, fishing on a boat. The uh, fishing vessel down there, I think I got it in sight. It looks like the lifeboat's right next to it. Fishing vessel equipped. Whenever uh, you can get a chance, uh, if I can get an update on your uh, situation. We got the vessel in tow. They're still taking on water. It's still very uh, up in the air on how well their pumps are keeping up. But well, he is sitting pretty heavy on that starboard side. Uh, there's definitely a lot of weight on him. Walking forward! Once we moored, our biggest concern, of course, was the, you know, still taking on water. That was goal number one to find out where she was taking on water from. Station 6-6, six, six. we got the cliffs tied to Port Dock 7. We're getting pumps rigged from the 6-8. I walked in through the cabin, looked into the engine room, and there was probably like six to seven holes of water spewing up and hitting the upper decks. Uh, and it was running down the starboard side, down past the engine. And so there was a lot of water coming in through where the hull had punctured on the jetty. Get, get a piece takes rigged in the water. The hole underneath the boat, trying to stick the tarp underneath. After a successful mission, coming back to the station, knowing that we impacted others, that we had a positive effect on people around us, that we were able to save their property, we were able to keep them from becoming injured, possibly saving their lives. It certainly is a feeling of accomplishment, a feeling of pride in what we do, and a feeling that I would absolutely not be wanting to do anything else in the world. My name's Scott Logger, and I live right here in Newport, Oregon. This is our puncture. Took a nice rock right into the water tank. And that part of the forward bulkhead there is part of the water tank on the back side. So we've got to weld in both sides of that. We were out on a normal crab trip. Fishing was great. Um, returning home uh, to a rebate, refuel, and head back out again. We start coming in and all of a sudden I noticed the main shut down. I said, why is the main shutting down? This is the wrong place for the main to go. 
the Northwest swell, there's nothing you can really do. Once you lose propulsion and Mother Nature, she's pushing you right into the rocks, you feel completely helpless. The boat was rocking and rolling up on the rocks. It steadily was going further over. You know, at one time, I think the mast even touched the water, which was put it on its, completely on its side. At that point, I proceeded to get my suit on, but the boat was rolling on its side. It's, I kept on getting pushed up against the rail. The rail was going into the water. My suit was filling up with water. The boat rolled one more time, and I went in the water. If it wasn't for the US Coast Guard, um, I probably wouldn't be here today. We will be back in the water, and we'll be back crabbing in the fall. Surfer on the south jetty. The waters here in Astoria are definitely treacherous. They're cold. There's a lot of currents. wonder if that's his surf board all bashed up in the rocks. What we know is it's a surfer who got washed up on the rocks. He just needs to get to a hospital as soon as possible. We got the horse. Roger, that target's sight. There you go. We teach commercial fishermen how to react in emergency situations. And if they practice these things, when the real thing happens, they'll react appropriately. Today's uh, a lot of dangerous stuff, so make sure everybody's got their eyes peeled and looking for things that are stupid. My name is Kurt Farrell. I'm a civilian employee of the Coast Guard. I retired and uh, was hired as a civilian. Commercial fishing is the most dangerous occupation in the United States. Given that, we put this class on to give the fishermen the skills necessary to make them a survivor so should something bad happen on the boat. Make sure that the business end of these are facing away from you when you light them off, OK? There you go. This morning, we started by shooting flares. We then went into firefighting. Two-man teams. The first guy is going to be the main firefighter, OK? The backup's going to be right behind him holding on to his shirt. Not many people actually get to use a portable fire extinguisher. So it's a good exercise. Fire, fire. No run. Man overboard. We now have a person in the water. 60 degrees. What's sight? Uh, port side. Port side, check us. We teach commercial fishermen how to react in emergency situations. And if they practice these things, when the real thing happens, they'll react appropriately. What if the person lost consciousness? Call the Coast Guard immediately yeah. and start Titles. trying to do CPR. Excellent. We have everybody from crewmen to captains to boat owners to people that want to be a crewman. Prevention is extremely important, so it doesn't turn into a search and rescue case. My name is Amy, and we are learning cold water survival training. And we learned how to put our Gumby suits on, our survival suits, which was very difficult. We learned techniques to get in and out of the life raft. So simulating someone who is hurt, who can't swim back to the raft, or is being dragged away by the current, so they have a throw ring that they can throw them. We've learned a variety of survival skills today that uh, I don't think I could have done them on the fly without, without. Uh... Crew Porter's back. Ready for attack. Chris Fisher, helicopter rescue swimmer here, Air Station Astoria. I just got word that we have a surfer in distress at the South Jetty up in Grace Harbor. I like to surf in my own time, and when I get word that there's a fellow surfer out on the rocks and they're kind of in a bad way, I definitely want to be there for those guys if, if they do need help. Surfer on the South Jetty of Grace Harbor. Let's go up there, see, uh, see if he needs to get pulled off or not. Let's go. When I found out about the SAR case, I found out that uh, we had fire rescue on scene with the patient. Due to his injuries, they didn't want to carry him down the entire jetty. It was a couple hundred yards long. So it just seemed to be a better decision to have us go help him, hoist him out of that situation, and get him to an ambulance close by. 
Right now we're not showing a whole lot of wind. It's looking out there, it doesn't look like there's a whole lot of wind. We're about 20 minutes out from being at Grace Harbor. As we took off, we just had basic information that the surfer was injured. There was EMS on scene, but we did not have radio communications with that person at the time. So we played through a couple scenarios on the way there just to get our minds wrapped around what we were doing, but we weren't really able to hone in on a plan. We will be in the vicinity of the jetty. A couple things, we'll just make sure that we don't waste any spots that might blow somebody off the jetty. Uh, so to be used, Chris, that's going to be up to you guys in the back. What do you think? Yeah, we'll make a uh, on-scene announcement. I'm Lieutenant Commander David McCown. I'm one of the pilots here at Air Station Astoria. What we know is it's a surfer who got washed up on the rocks, so we're expecting to do a litter hoist because we don't know the extent of his injuries. Putting him in a litter is generally going to be the safest thing we can do because it supports the neck, it supports the back, and it prevents any further in injuries from that point. We're pretty much on scene. We've got uh, the jetty inside. All right, so we don't have calls for EMS down with the patient. We're just going to have to take action into ourselves, and I'll go down there and check out the scene. Door's coming over. after we received the call of an injured surfer that was on the jetties at Grace Harbor. All right, so we don't have calls from EMS down with the patient. We're just going to have to take action into ourselves, and I'll go down there and check out the scene. When we arrived on scene, there were several people with the injured surfer on the jetties. So we pre-briefed that we were going to put Chris down and have him evaluate the situation. We go over all the risk analysis, make sure uh, what we're doing is safe and everybody's on board with the task. How do you guys think about a hoist right here to the, to the jetty? Yeah, if you want to get me on that flat rock right there, then I think it's likely we'll be able to find a spot that's not too close oh, where we're affecting the guy with rotor wash, but Chris could probably hike over a few rocks, right? Oh, yeah. Really what a jetty is, it's a long line of big rocks they put in the water to protect the harbor and keep the harbor calm. When it comes to hoisting off this, it becomes very difficult because they're just big, jagged rocks that are slippery, that are difficult to move around on. And so now we're dealing with EMS personnel, some Coast Guard trained personnel on these slippery, sharp rocks, and we're getting ready to bring a hurricane force wind on top of them to do this hoist. Coming down to right. 80 feet. Ready for one harness delivery of swimmer to the jetty. Roger, sir, directly below us. Check swimmer. Go test, please. Swimmer's going down. The things that I was considering as I'm sending Chris down to the jetty were basically to, to find him a semi-flat surface to put him on and, and to make sure I operate the hoist smoothly so that I don't slam him down against the rocks and he can get good footing. Summer's going down. Position altitude is good. Summer's five feet above the rocks. Summer's going down. Summer is on the jetty, disconnecting. Summer is away. Summer is okay. Summer is making its way towards Survivor. The waters here in Astoria are definitely treacherous. They're cold. There's a lot of currents, a lot of quick moving currents. And the waves breaking as high as they were on the jetty and the helicopter rotor wash kind of picking up that water and throwing it into the air made this super slippery, especially wearing wetsuit booties. Some of those waves are kind of gnarly. I wonder if that's his uh, blue surfboard all bashed up in the rocks. Yeah, there's a white one down there, too. When I got on scene, I saw two surfboards. So then I immediately started to think, well, is there two survivors? Well, actually, that was his surfboard basically in half in a plane that I've never seen a surfboard break. Like, having never surfed, isn't there a point where you just kind of fall in lieu of dying against the rocks? Maybe the, the wave was just too tasty. Walking him down the jetty and it being an uneven surface, it could potentially be more hazardous to our patient than to just hoist him into the helicopter. So I turn around and pull out my radio. I contacted my helicopter and started talking with them. It's kind of breaking up a little bit. And I noticed that half my screen is lit up and half my screen is dead. And then all of a sudden, I'm talking, 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 nothing. I wonder if it's on his end, something wrong with his radio. Go ahead. Set it up to a series nine, so I mean it. Yeah, swimmer for the two nine, go ahead. I ended up going to the fire rescue guy that was there, 
and asking if I could borrow his radio. Tried to call the helicopter on a different frequency. They weren't listening to that frequency. So I had to call the small boat station around the corner. The small boat station relayed my message to the helicopter. Station from the 3-9. I've got comms with your swimmer. He's requesting a backboard with the litter. All right. Litter's outside cabin door. Litter's going down. He just needs to get to a hospital as soon as possible. So we're going to put our litter down because we have to use a litter that's specifically designed to be hoisted into our aircraft. All right, he's in our litter. The litter is slightly more difficult to hoist and bring in the cabin than the basket. It tends to swing from the hook due to the rotor wash. And it's a little more difficult when it gets around the knife edge of the cabin to prevent the survivor from basically impacting the side of the helicopter. We get the hoist. Roger, that target sight, taking the load. Driver is clear of the rocks, clear, easy back and left. Clear back and left. Roger. Better just below cabin door. How about I hold here? Stop the swing. Preparing to bring the litter inside the cabin. Once you see the person you're bringing into the cabin, it, it becomes a real scenario where you, where you kind of become attached to that person, knowing that it's your responsibility to get them to care as soon as possible. Litter's inside the cabin. See, does it look like that other guy wants to come up? Yeah, I don't know if Chris wants to come up or not. After Justin pulled the litter in and put the survivor in the, in the cabin, he turned around and sent the hook back down for me, and I made the decision to just lift the paramedic with me. So it was one hoist instead of two. And taking the load. One of the things in the medical world is we can never take somebody from a higher level of care to a lower level of care. So that's why we brought the paramedic with us, because at least he stayed with the paramedic level of care. Thanks for survivor inside cabin. When I came up to the cabin and saw the patient for the first time in the helicopter, he seemed to be stable. We had about a two minute flight from the jetty to the landing pad. Guys, we're gonna be coming into the pad, got plenty of power. EMS is on deck. Right. Ford 40. Better says good, Ford 40. As we are coming in, the ambulance was right there, the doors were open. Local EMS is ready to take him, and that's great because it significantly reduces the time for that survivor until he's in the level of care that he needs. All right, yeah. park and break is set. You guys are cleared in now as you want to go. It always feels good to get out and help somebody, especially if they're a fellow surfer. You see these people in the water, and you know sometimes you think, and if this guy was in trouble, would I be able to come help him? And this time I was actually able to help the guy. First time surfing. Oh, that was his first time? Surfing, yeah. Oh, geez. Oh, wow. Welcome to the sport. We arrived on scene quickly, executed it as we're supposed to, and, and got the patient to the next level of care. Overall, it was a success for us. I just wish the best to the surfer. Come on, dude, it's snowing, you love it. Hi, I'm David McCann, I'm one of the pilots over here at Sector Columbia River. One of the things I've learned about the weather here in Astoria is you just never know what you're gonna get. Snow and the ice and the wind. This is absolutely kind of miserable. Shuts town down. My name is Joanne Landrin. I am David McCallan's wife. Do you wanna do some wine tasting? Yeah, go down there and drink some wine and try to warm up a little bit. So for the rest of the day, we are going wine tasting at the cellar on 10th. Hey. Hey, how are you Good doing? Good uh, nice seeing you again. So the very first wine is from Napa Valley. Should go really well with like paella. That's pretty good. One of the neat things about serving in a small town is you eventually get to know everybody. And now we're pretty good friends with Tila, who's one of the employees down there. Thank you so much. Turley Zinfandel. Definitely lots of plum to this, dark cherries. My name is Tila Evans. David and Joanne McCowan are absolutely fantastic. When they come in, they're always asking questions about, OK, what should I be tasting in a wine? Where did it come from? What type of grape is it? This is Petite Syrah. Petite Syrah, they're hard to beat. Little piece of chocolate with that. Here. Yeah. Oh, wow. ask and thou shalt receive. Thank you. So what do you guys think? I don't know. That was pretty good. Oh, yeah. 
Being in the Coast Guard world, being in the military world where you move a lot, it's definitely difficult to come into an area, make friends. For Dave, moving me from Rhode Island, from I know one, I'm like, what am I gonna do if? Coast Guard spouses and stuff, they are all part of the whole family. We've been really fortunate here that we have found some great friends who also enjoy wine tasting. <laughs> oh, Thank you. You're welcome. Appreciate Next week will be Sicilian wines. Ooh. You ready to go brave the snow again, hon? So today was a great day. We got to be in the snow, and then we got to taste some wine, and it was good wine. Thank you. Hopefully see you guys soon. Appreciate it. It's just a good day to be out with some of my best friends, and it's nice to have that connection because it makes the town really feel like home. You're in the exact right spot where we think the guy might be. Routine traffic stop by the Oregon State Police. Uh, the person that had been pulled over had uh, ran into the woods. The troopers are pretty certain that the guy is armed. He might have some type of a weapon, so we're concerned would he at any point choose to shoot at the helicopter. That looks like a dude sitting there with a hoodie. My name is Dean Burdick. I'm a deputy with the Tillamook County Sheriff's Office, but I'm also the search and rescue coordinator for Tillamook County. Today, we've been called to a subject that um, had actually left his vehicle and went off into a, a rugged area of the Tillamook State Forest. This area can be described as really rugged timber with steep cliffs and terrain, thick brush, thick trees with streams and waterways that cross through the terrain. It's very difficult to navigate and to search in. Hey, this is Petty Officer Woodford. How may I help you? Hey, it's Master Chief Tilt. Okay, Dylan. Hey, how's it going, Master Chief? Good. Hey, you've got a phone call request from uh, OSP for helicopter support. They had a suspect bolt on them. He's up in the hills above Garibaldi. They're asking if there's a possibility of any assistance from a helicopter in locating. 3 zero zero. Roger. Lieutenant Jason Maddox, MH-60 Tango pilot, Air Station Astoria. It was a uh, routine traffic stop by the uh, Oregon State Police. Uh, the person that had been pulled over had uh, ran into the woods, so they asked us to help locate him. Sector 6035, we are the 05 POV, get around assigned mission. We are the ready of the air. The area that we are searching is right next to the station to them in a small town called Garibaldi. It's not a typical mission for us, but we like to help other agencies if we can. We'll be at Tillamook in uh, 15 minutes. Roger. It was actually a beautiful day, which is nice around here because it is a beautiful place to fly when the weather's not crummy. What I caught was something happened. The police apprehended one suspect and then saw one or two other people run away. I asked them if there's a deputy that's going to be at the film to fly with us. Lieutenant Jason Condon, 860 Pilot Air Station Astoria. We wanted somebody to come with us that knew the details of the case. This is what they want. This is what they're going to do if they see him. There will be a deputy for you guys to pick up. Over. Sector 35, Roger. I got the target site. 420. Right, Mark, will you go out and talk to him? Roger. So I got off the plane expecting to find an Oregon State Police member, and it turned out we were actually taking a petty officer from Tillamook Bay who is familiar with the area. Who do we have with us, Mark? BM1 Lavelle. Hey, BM1. So do you have uh, inside information in terms of knowing exactly where we're searching for this guy? Yeah, basically right off to your starboard side here. We're going to head over to those clear cuts. It's only suspected that he has a weapon right now. He's got one tennis shoe on, um, and he ended up uh, high-tailing it up in some trees. So I'm not a gun guy. What is the stand-up distance we should be at? We were told that he might be armed, that he might have some type of a weapon. So again, we're concerned, would he at any point choose to shoot at the helicopter? We have to decide risk versus gain. Where are we willing to put ourselves? Probably just a regular minimum hovering altitude far enough so we can keep eyes on him. But uh, I don't want to get too close, obviously. So up till now, uh, our only description of this individual is that he possibly could be armed. He's wearing gray pants and has one red shoe on. He could set into hypothermia pretty quickly as the night falls. 
and on the go. All right, we are direct to that long that we have. Police cruiser 1711, 6035. Uh, unit 1711, I copy. I'm the one that's up on the landing. We were talking to the Oregon State Police on the radio. Um, initially arriving on scene, we wanted to locate their position to give us a better idea of the general area that we were supposed to be searching. Uh, it's going to be east west. I have my overhead lights on my patrol car. Um, there should be like a dirt road that we are probably flying over right about now. Do you see a car? I can't see it. Okay, yeah, I can see it. It's 2 o'clock. You see all that wood that's out there that's really white? We're right out there with its lights on. 1711, 6035. Request enough if you can factor us into where you think they might be. Uh, in this ravine down below us is where we pulled the other occupant of the vehicle from, and we think the one that's still out there may be in that same general area. Typically, it's pretty challenging to do inland searches here, primarily because of the terrain. Do you guys see any uh, hazards to note? I just saw those power lines running up the mountain, but they were below the tree line. There wasn't any logging activity in the area, which is great. It was a very small search area. We found the sheriff car. So you're in the exact right spot where we think the guy might be. So he thinks overhead now. He told us where he went into the woods, so we just set up a pattern and flew down the valley multiple times, uh, offsetting different directions. I'll be more on the left side of the ridge line. Roger. And if you can do it at a slow speed, you're comfortable. The police officer that was on scene was on one side of the valley. It was very, very heavily covered. On both sides peaks, it becomes very tight once you start to fly. So it gives us a little less ability to maneuver. So right here, if I get any slower, I'm going to require more power. OK. About as slow as I can go, Chief. Chief was using the EOIR to look for a heat signature, and the flight mech was looking out the door for anything that stood out to him. What do you think the chances are of finding him? Well, it's difficult because of the amount of cover. If he's down in the ravine and he's somewhat open, we should be able to find him. First couple of times through, really didn't see a lot. Following, I would say, about the second pass, we noticed a couple of heat signatures, so we decided to investigate those a little further. Can you hold that position right there? Did you think you saw something? What do you think the chances are of finding him? Well, it's difficult because of the amount of cover. We received a call looking for an individual running from the police department somewhere around 5'7". Uh, we knew they had gray sweatpants on, not really sure of a shirt, and supposedly one shoe. I believe it was red. If he's down in the ravine and he's somewhat open, we should be able to find him. With the camera that we have mounted on the forward end of the helicopter, the infrared portion of it helps for a heat signature to stand out. So if I was looking into a cold area, say the woods, and a human being was walking around, I would get an outline of that human being. You hold that position right there? There's a heat signature. Following the second pass, we noticed a couple of heat signatures. So we decided to investigate those a little further. That looks like a dude sitting there with a hoodie. Yeah, and he's got a cap on. All right, stand by and positions up. We were able to look at it, but we weren't able to pull out the type of detail that we would normally like to see, where we can actually see a human being, hands, feet, that type of thing. Where is he in relation to us, Chief? He's back? Right now, fine. he's back at about the 5 o'clock position, or that heat signature is back at the 5 o'clock position. You see what I'm looking at, Mark? I see it on there, Chief, but I don't see it outside. Yeah, and it may not be anything. I'm just trying to see if it'll move. The problem with the heat signature is that uh, a lot of different things emit heat, whether they be other animals or just inanimate objects that are heated by the sun. And it's not painting anything like it was before. It did look like a guy sitting there, though, didn't it? It did. It looked exactly oh, like that. For me, being a flight mech, it wasn't a, an optimal searching position to be in because I can't really see down through the trees from a 1,000 feet and be able to pick out a person. Finding him with my naked eyes would have kind of been like finding a needle in a haystack. And I see something moving at 3 o'clock low. And it looks like a guy sitting down. Uh, sir, can I call you a little bit? Yeah, definitely call me. Roger, uh, Fort Ride 25. We were still about 500 feet above the deck, and I thought that I saw him. Yeah, that's totally a guy sitting down. Yeah, 1711 uh, We have what appears to be an individual with a gray sweatshirt. From your position, can you see? the best way for us to get to him. 
I was thinking he went up the creek, probably. Just straight up the ravine. Yeah, I'm still trying to find that on the EOIR, sir. Zero three five five. Uh, we're taking a look right now. We'll get back to you in a couple of minutes. I can't see it anymore, sir. So you can call us any direction if that will help. Uh, I think we're good. Just holding here. I'm just looking for around for it again, sir. Good. You seeing anything down there, Chief? Right now, man. Uh, yeah, I'm not seeing anything anymore, sir. As we came down, I kind of lost my reference and uh, the picture changed. All right, well, I'll uh, pass the police so we're just, we lost it, but we'll, we'll hover here for a little bit more. We have lost visual with the suspect. We'll just continue searching. When you have a long search like that, and it's something that you're continuously looking for but you're not able to locate, you have to constantly Focus on the details. What am I looking for? Who am I looking for? Can I find it? I want to find it. Let's go ahead and do Walmart Pass, a little bit closer to the left side. Does that sound Sounds good? And let's do what we have. I'm going to take the time. I'm going to focus in. I want to find it. I want to be the one that finds them. It's the same thing for any search you'll see. It's the same thing for any search on land. You know, you want to be that person that calls Mark, 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 and there they are. If you feel comfortable, I'd move to the right, and I would come down to the left so we can look directly down to the trees before we lose the sun. And I would go over as close as you're comfortable to the police car, and then I would move our way down the valley. Let's go ahead and just start here. We continued to search for as long as we felt comfortable, but as the sun began to set, we had saturated the area fairly well. We felt like we had given a good overview of where the individual might be, and we passed that information to the local group that was on the ground. Coast Guard, if you don't have uh, contact, I would say stand out and call it. Okay. And I was going to say exactly what he just said. Yep. All right. Uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, take off out of here. Uh, sorry we couldn't help you more. Thank you so very much for your help. We do appreciate it. Roger. 6035, out. Tillamook County has used the United States Coast Guard for several years here. One of the biggest assets that we have is their aircraft support. In a mission like this one here, we're in very dense wooded areas where it's very difficult to see a missing subject. Once the Coast Guard Hilo spotted the person, it allowed us to get our ground teams to activate into a certain area, and Pacific was located later that evening in good condition. We're very grateful um, on behalf of the Sheriff's Department to have a partnership with the United States Coast Guard Air Assets, which ultimately resulted in a positive outcome in this case.